obviously this is Richard Klein. And let me just uh, tell you, by the way, that you can Twitter a question. Oh yeah, we are all tooled up for Twittering here. Uh, if you want to Twitter a question, apparently what you have to do is you write to the hashtag, which is hash SIDLAW, and then uh, you, you put your question. If you don't have a Twitter account, then download the festival app. Apparently it's iPhones only, not Android, and you go into the particular session and you ask a session on that session page of the app. I wished I'd read that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm sure it's easy. Best if you've got a Twitter, Twitter account, use the Twitter account. If not, you can stick your hand up, for goodness sake. It's like we're, we're amongst friends here. Um, so that's what you can do. Um, Richard, this is your third session, so you're becoming an old hand at this. Yep. Uh, campaign on Twitter to save BBC Four, so will it be your last? Uh, that's the only question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. Okay. Um, well, look, another thing to say. One is, uh, it's actually rather charming and flattering that there is a campaign uh, to save BBC Four, although I don't think BBC Four is in danger of disappearing. Um, and naturally, of course, it's very nice to have that sort of response from audiences. It, it suggests that we're doing, the channel's doing what I think we should be doing as a channel. I, don't, I would say this, though. Um, uh, I, I, I think the, the campaign, such as it is, and it seems to be pretty busy and vocal and so on, is as much a vote of thanks and support for the BBC as it is for BBC4. Um, it suggests that... I think you're being disingenuous. Um, I think it's a vote for BBC4, and I tell you what... I'm rarely modest, I, I promise you. So. No, 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 really, I was following everybody, and they were all saying... You know, uh, the, the people that I was following mm. were saying, Axe BBC 3, save BBC 4. They really were. Well, in that case, it's just BBC 4. Great, um, is I would say, look, the channel is not going to get cut. That's uh, not going to happen. Clearly, generally speaking, uh, the BBC as a whole is looking to make 20% cuts, DQF as it's called. Uh, it's a, it means delivering quality first, but plenty of people have found new words that fit that, those three letters. <laughs> I won't go through them now. You can work them out for yourselves. We could have uh, a few Twitter you can have some, Yeah, you can Twitter it if you want. That's a good thing to do. Um, uh, and BBC4 will take its share of cuts like everybody else, I'm sure. Um, uh, and, and in that strategic review, there are a whole load of questions uh, which get asked about what's the purpose of four, what's the purpose of one, two, three, all the rest of it. And also, where should... You know, if we're going to have to make some reductions, and as I said, virtually every other arts organisation, by the way, is facing similar kinds of levels of, of reductions. So we're not un, we're not unusual in that. It's just a very visible thing, as opposed to other organisations. I, I think the, 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 the question is, though, is mm. why did we not suddenly get a, a great groundswell of "Don't cut BBC Three or something? I mean, this, these these rumours do come from somewhere, don't they? Well, I, I, I don't know why it is that people have decided to support BBC4 in this way. I mean, it, it, right. perhaps it's testimony to the fact that we're running a great channel and I'm delighted about that. Right. I tell you what, we're going to see, uh, we're going to look at what you've been up to. This is what it is. Do it. God almighty. It's very hard to be there, eh? I guess I want to do it because I'm still dancing. <laughs> the dream never goes away. Full of scorpions is my mind. Murder and treason! Will you not fail? Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. All hail Macbeth! I'm not any sweets. Yeah. My fecal forum presentation text has been translated into 17 different languages. Are you single and looking for love? No. I'm married and looking for cake. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lucy Worsley, chief curator at Historic Royal Palaces. Another day at the office. I'll be tracing the story of British domestic life through four rooms. The bedroom, the living room, the bathroom, and the kitchen. <laughs> I'll be exploring the ways that our attitudes and habits have changed. What do you know? I know about Manchester. Who wants to see a back street in the middle of nowhere? That's the beauty of it. The story of a street. Yeah, but there isn't a single thing I like about it. We're only talking a trial program, not for transmission. This has to work, Tony. Not just for you, for all of us. A 
have here a box, what would happen if I were to remove everything I possibly could from inside it? What then exists inside the space in the box? Is it really nothing? I alt er hun blevet stukket 21 gange. Et stik er gået gennem hjertet og har været dødeligt. Det kan du se. I'm exploring a rich tradition of art, full of power and vivid expression, but also to many deeply unfamiliar, the art of Germany. This is a journey of rediscovery. Hmm. Am I being sick? I, I watched the killing and that, that, that killing wasn't in it, was it? Is that killing too? That's killing too. Oh, That's right. Oh, I thought we were look a preview, mm. just of one programme. <laughs> I didn't make it there, there, there Gives you an idea of, of our year, I suppose. It was brilliant, the killing. Uh, in fact, hey, we've had our first tweet. The killing is a one off. Is, is the killing a one off event, or do you think it'll open the door to more foreign language drama in the UK? Well, it certainly is, um, it, it's actually not the thing which has opened the door to foreign language drama on BBC Four because we've had Valendach or Valendach or something like that on BBC <laughs> Four for some time now, which has done yeah. very good business for us, um, and also Spiral. Uh, the Butcher of La Villette, which is a French murder drama, which has also done extremely good business for us. So we Perhaps The Killing was the first one that, the that most of us through. had heard of. I think The Killing has broken through in a way that no other has in terms of foreign language. Um, and we've got one or two others lined up, uh, I hope, over the next six or eight months, including The Killing 2 coming up, which is terrific, actually. Yeah, but um, it looks good. I think what, what it shows is there is an appetite. I wouldn't say it's, a, a, uh, you know, this isn't two or three million uh, people, but there is an appetite audiences to sort of not worry about subtitles. Uh, it's the quality of the drama. Uh, and I also think what we've done on four is to suggest that, you know, Saturday nights on four have the same sort of appeal as they do during the rest of the week, but they're entertainment. Uh, I've been saying for some time now that what four is a, is a mainstream entertainment channel. We just happen to offer people this kind of entertainment because that's how they like to be entertained. It's a critical thing for four. And I should just say that as and when uh, the DQF announcements are made, and as and when there are some final determinations about what it is that we're going to have to do and what we're going to deal with and so on, one thing will be true. The channel, as far as I'm concerned, will stay true to its ideals of offering what we do as much as we can. In other words, the essence of four, about opinion, perspective, having something to say, being a channel which actually appeals to people who like to think, for whom thinking and engaging in discourse is, is entertaining, information is entertaining, that will stay. Hopefully with a bit of wit and entertainment, if I can manage that. Yeah, and I think it does help if you've got surtitles on, that kind of the, the, the Danes in particular, but they don't say very much, do they? they do, there's a lot of looking a, around. She, and it, she it stares a lot, help. actually, Sophie, yeah. uh, bless her. She's actually here, she's doing a session. I know, uh, it's I'm be so really, excited. It, I want to touch the sacred jumper. Uh, I, have, I have actually um, kissed the sacred cheek. And no. I, 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 was, I married, but it was thrilling. <laughs> I got a genemigung, as we would say in Germany, which is a chit. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I could almost speak Danish. <laughs> it's just and that, you will by the time we finish. It's, with the it's <laughs> that good. Yeah. Um, what, was, what were you most proud of in the... In that, that, and I noticed there were a number of those that had won awards, actually. I mean, for different reasons, that, that's, a, that's a lovely collection of programmes. I mean, obviously, um, The Road to Coronation Street, I think I'm proud of it because we spotted it. It had been rejected by other places. We took it. It's a very BBC4 drama in the sense that it's mainstream. It's about Coronation Street, for goodness sake. But it's a very BBC4 take. It's a tiny slice. Plus, we won the BAFTA which I'm, and RTS, which I'm really, really proud of. And also, I imagine ITV are less than pleased now. Um, bless them. Uh, it's okay, they're making profits. Yeah, well, fair enough, that's their duty. Um, I think Agony and Ecstasy stands out there as well, though, because there is ballet, difficult to make work on television, but we did it as observational documentary. There is something truly spicy about saying there is this ethereal, uh, beautiful kind of display, which is uh, elegant and, and fragile and so forth, and yet behind the scenes, it's a bloodbath. 
Well, uh, I think it helped that Black Swan was on as well at the same time. I, at a I, I won't time. claim that I had nothing to do with that, but, uh, <laughs> I, but, but I think that did help a bit, but I think it was a really good piece of documentary filmmaking. And she has credited it with um, re reinvigorating her career, which was going down, so well, well done there. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, so I'm, I'm particularly proud of that. Are there any regrets, or any regrets that you would wish to share with us, perhaps? You mean over the last year or so? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you look at something else and you go, I wished I'd said yes to that, or I wish they'd come to me with that. Well, there are always things which appear, I'm, I'm trying, to, I'm racking my brains down to think of things that I would want. Um, Big Brother, we should have taken that up, clearly. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, yeah. you know, I, I I'll be honest with you, there are various programs, I, I won't name programs, there are programs that go out on BBC4 occasionally where I would kind of go, I wish I'd had a chance to kind of get my hands onto that one and do a bit more work on it to make it better. I, I, I'm a former commissioning editor and a former director, and so inevitably there's a sort of twitchy finger, which can be irritating to the program makers, for which I apologise. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I was looking at that and I was thinking, some of those, uh, obviously some of the, mo the, the biggest uh, rating successes for you have been mm. dramas, and yet I read that you're going to do fewer dramas and less comedy? Well, what you'll be reading is speculation. As you know, I can't indulge in speculation because uh, we're, I'm not at liberty to make any comments. However, uh, what I would say is we are doing, we're going to carry on doing drama. I'm, I'm, I've just commissioned uh, a, a new, uh, at least two by 90 um, adaptation of Alan First's Spies of Warsaw. Alan First is a major worldwide best-selling writer, anybody who knows his books, uh, the Polish officer, etc. He's a brilliant writer who's captured I think better than most, actually, the, the pre-war. War is looming. There's a shadow across Europe. And people are working in a kind of strange hinterland. And there's love affairs, and there's bad behavior, and there's a lot riding on the roll of dices. That is commissioned for BBC4 coming next summer. It'll be, I think, a terrific, at least two-parter. Um, so we're not out of drama in any way. Uh, inevitably, when we're faced with, with some cuts, there will be some decisions to make about the extent to which and so forth, but that's all in play. So drama will carry on. We've got, um, coming up later this year, um, Holy Flying Circus, the Monty Python uh, story about life of Brian, which is a really good piece of work. And um, we'll take Manhattan about David Bailey and Gene Shrimpton and their time in, in New York, uh, how they sort of revolutionized fashion photography. So there's plenty of drama. Do it gently, you know, there's, there's plenty coming. Uh, just another tweet. H how has your brief changed with the emergence of multi-platform and transmedia? Oh, yeah. who asked that one? Come on, uh, put your hand up. Um, well, I suppose, uh, would this be a time to talk about the BBC 4's involvement with Archive, which is a multi-platform? Um, ah, this is one of the things you were going to talk is, about is it, a bit is it, later is on. Is it worth? Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know. Hey, look, I don't know quite what that means. Um, uh, if I'm honest it's with you, we don't. Multi-platform is when you go into a train station and there's too many and you can't you can't find your way out. Right. Well, we don't have a lot of multi-platform uh, space on BBC Four. I don't think we're particularly geared to that. A lot of those multi-platform kind of major pieces, I think, are largely entertainment uh, um, things. Oh, we, we, so we have one which is only Connect, which I think has got a really big multi-platform line. I think The Wall, which is our game that we play through Only Connect with Victoria Corrin, I think racked up four million hits in the last series. That is huge. Only Connect is back on air, bigger, biggest figures ever, and we have got two special Only Connects coming up later this year, which anybody's interested is a big multi, that is a multi-platform thing, I've got one. There you go. I found you see, one. I don't know, I asked that I've question and one. it could have been about football. I have no idea what the, what the question is. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if I've got the, given the right answer either. There but we I, go. We, we do have multi-platform, we're big on and it. You, and you're doing well, Emma. And we're doing there well. There we go, right. I tell you what, we're going to see what, uh, we're going to see, uh, see another uh, clip now. This is uh, what viewers and some industry bods think of the oh channel. God, this is like seeing a kind of report, isn't it? <laughs> it treats you like an intelligent adult. It stimulates you, makes, you know, um, likes your curiosity. Wonderful, fantastic. It's like Radio 4 for on the telly. I'm not sure I'm bright enough to watch BBC4 for that often. Occasionally, though, I come across it and it just has this real gem and you think, oh my God, that's amazing. I think it's a shame that they're actually pulling funding out of the drama for BBC4 because there's been some great stuff. It's had, for me, the drama hit of the year in The Killing. Um, I never thought I'd sit, find myself sitting watching dark Copenhagen night after night after night. Also, The Road to Coronation Street, which was the one-off drama, which was just one of the biggest dramas that had been on British television over the last year. I think my nan watches BBC4. They have more documentaries. It's more cultural television. Who thinks to make a documentary about electricity? 
you know, and how pylons came to dominate our um, countryside. A really high-end quiz where you feel super clever when you watch it. It's probably the only place on British TV where someone can say epsilon and people kind of snigger, chuckle and, and, and slightly applaud and that for me there should be a place for that on BBC4. I love Charlie Brooker's Screen Wipe. It's like really funny, irreverent stuff, very zeitgeist, very to the point. I think it's an amazing presenter and it's the exact sort of talent you need for BBC4. They can cut anything, they can cut the strategies or anything as far as I'm concerned, but let's leave BBC4 alone. See, even Lorraine Hedges thinks Lorraine that Hedges, it's going. Great yeah. control of wine, I've got to say. Yeah, but she still thinks, she, she's another one who thinks that you're, you're facing the chop. She'll get a gig. <laughs> I was talking again. I tell you what, the, the only, uh, everybody was very positive there. Mm. Uh, the only negative was, I'm not quite sure I'm intelligent enough uh, to watch BBC Four. I mean, it's often, it's not an unusual comment actually, whenever we've done our own research into audiences, that there's a sense that it, there's a barrier, a bit elitist. And I think that's the nature of the channel. It is a little bit like that. There is a bit of sense of it, and it's quite hard to get around it. I th I'm hoping that some of the things we're doing, like Only Connect, or although there's a very bit of a brain-twisting <laughs> show, but things like uh, the chronicles, what the dramas are meant to do, and some of the comedies, they are aimed at, and some of our more entertaining pieces out of entertainment are aimed at saying to audiences that look, this isn't you know you can you can you can enjoy this program while thinking about things at the same time. That it isn't quite as Difficult. I mean, I think what we're trying to do is make, make difficult, difficult stuff entertaining, um, uh, not as it were dumbing down. But, but I suppose one of the things I would say that, that, that is one of the hallmarks of four, which I hope people understand, is that we try and do it with a sense of wit. I, I genuinely think most of the time there's a smile on our faces when we, when we sell these kind of programs. Lucy Worsley, who's I think a terrific presenter, and you know, there you are finding out about the history of the house, and it's pretty detailed. There's a lot of content. It's up for debate about if you completely agree with it or not, and it's one of the things we do quite a lot, is we say something about something rather than the be all and end, about, end all about something. That you can watch it and also enjoy it. I think that idea of entertaining, entertaining intelligent programming would be a hallmark of ours. It remains a battle, though, to make sure that as many people as possible come to it, I, that, that, that they don't have that sense of it being a bit elitist. I think that is a is an ongoing issue for us. You see, I wonder if there, that there isn't this uh, sort of feeling that BBC Four is, is is the one which might go because you you have almost taken the mantle from BBC Two. I mean, BBC Two used to be the automatic, you know, before we had nine hundred stations um, on the television. BBC Two used to be the one where you'd go to if you didn't want to watch anything on BBC One or, or, or ITV. If you didn't want anything that was purely entertainment, you wanted something that had a bit more meat on it. Your natural home was BBC Two and then BBC Four came along and BBC Two has lost audiences and the automatic thing is they're going to get rid of BBC Four, they're going to merge it with BBC Two and make BBC Two better. Well I don't think that will happen, That's, uh, pretty sure it won't happen, but um, a number of things. One is I think BBC Two has always been uh, the BBC's premier factual channel and it still is. Uh, it's a mainstream broad channel and I think we're a mainstream niche channel. That's one thing. Secondly, I think attitudinally, four is completely different to two. We're about presenters with a real perspective. I mean, let's take science as an example. Brian Cox does Wonders of the Universe, which is terrific, fantastic. At the same time, we have Jim Alcalady doing Everything and Nothing, a programme about everything and a programme about nothing. Really odd stuff, rated very well, completely different. I mean, I think that piece to camera that um, Brian did when he went to Namibia and did one piece to camera in, some, in the Skeleton Coast probably cost as much as the whole series that we made. Um, but we drove entertainment through ideas. I, I think there is place for both of them. I think they are distinctive. I would say 90% of what you see on BBC4, you wouldn't ever see on BBC2. There is naturally overlap. We're a portfolio of channels, and it's right there's overlap. Good for licence fee. Um, I don't think it's possible to merge the two, because I think they're very distinctive. I think they have a, an audience that certainly think they're distinctive. It's, it, and often it's commentators in the media that seem to have more of a problem with one of the differences between two and four than audiences who do seem to know the difference. I mean, you can hear Yes, it's there. not about the, the, the differences, it's the fact that BBC Two has lost audience and, and you, while, whilst you've got a but kind of small fan base, as it were, but, it, but it's a... Growing. Sm it was small and growing. Thank you. But nevertheless, it's still, you know, exponential. We are small, still, I can't deny that. No, 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 it's still, <laughs> still small, small but perfectly formed. Thank you. Um, but the BBC Two ha, ha, has lost, as I said, it sort of yep. seems to have lost, it, it has lost audience. And therefore, that's that feeling. I think that's the feeling that you know BBC Four is where it's happening. 
Well, uh, let's be clear, um, BBC Two and Channel Four have both lost audiences. I think a lot of major terrestrial channels have lost audience. We're in, we're in, a, in a digital era uh, and digital is rising and multi-channel means that all channels are inevitably facing losses and digital channels uh, uh, to begin with tend to do better. We're, we're not quite 10 years old, still growing 20% a year. So that's inevitable. Um, so I, I, I sort of feel that BBC Two is merely reflecting the times. It's not about BBC Two particularly. BBC, the Channel 4 has suffered similar losses um, and no one worries about its distinctiveness. It seems pretty distinctive. Yeah. When you talk about 20% cuts... Yeah, um, which I haven't. But anyway, oh, you know, the BBC overall. Oh, the BBC yes. overall. Yeah. No, but presumably you're also going to have to make quite... Something. ...swinging cuts. Um, where, where do you think... Do you think that the, the audience at home will see it or do you think it'll be... Um, independent producers who are going to see it in the fact that you're going to be uh, saying, I want an hour of quality television for 20p. For Tuttle's Hayley, yeah. The BBC overall, the BBC Vision, has been for the last four years, within the fourth year now, and, is, and next year is the final year of a five-year programme to become more efficient and take 5% out of costs per year. So we have already been on a major cost drive, and I think it's difficult to see... Um, uh, the vast majority of savings coming from cutting budgets further. I think we're kind of, there's always room for a bit, but I think we're, the majority has already taken place over the last four or five years. So inevitably, uh, um, the big debate's been scope or efficiencies, and I would argue that the, 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 the weight may well head towards scope. That means that people will see a difference, I'm sure. You can't take 20% out of a machine like the BBC, BBC Vision, and not recognise that there will be a difference and what there will be less of what, what there will, that's, people have been clamouring from various sources for a smaller BBC and now they're going to get one. Um, so yeah, I think there will be a visible, it'll, you'll see it. Uh, it's, one of my jobs will be to make sure that as far as possible, those cuts have as little impact as possible, um, that people see it as little as possible, that we, we make sure that we get every penny of value at a licence fee and these are givens, but I might as well state them. But I'm in no doubt in my own mind that there's a consequence to the 20% cut. Uh, we're going to look now at the future, what is coming up in the autumn and uh, the longer term. Um, obviously, the killing two, as we yeah. saw in that VT, that, that's coming up. Yep. What else? Um, the next big, I suppose the next big thing we've got at the moment is um, a big season on the British Army. Uh, I was sort of very interested in the Army as an institution, not military or war or whatever, but the army itself as an institution. It's one of the great institutions of, of British life, perhaps in the form more than it has been um, in the last five or ten years or so. So I wanted to recalibrate and reconsider it, not in any way um, necessarily criticise it or judge it, but just look at it. Um, so there's a big season on the screen, uh, three-parter on Sandhurst. And, and is that just on the army itself and not, or not the families of the people? It's just the it? army institution itself. Um, but what we're also doing is we're launching the BBC4 archive collections, uh, which will be a series of ongoing programming that was purely online, where we raid the archives and pick out the very best, using the spark of origination, as I like to call it, um, which is to reassess and reconsider what we've already got in the archive, not just say, here's 7,000 hours on the army, choose, you, choose what you like. We will pick the best. We'll pick what we think is specific and interesting, which sheds light on not only the British Army, as it's been filmed over the last 40 or 50 years, and some of it's really interesting. There's um, observation documentary footage of the Marines, of paratroopers, of soldiers becoming soldiers, of Trooping the Colours. Really interesting stuff from 50s and 60s as well as the 70s and 80s. Um, that'll all go on screen. Uh, you can see it online. And then we'll have our, our, um, our television programmes playing on air and people can jump from one to the other. Um, and that's an ongoing process. There are two or three more uh, similar sort of collections being collected or picked as we go through, they'll be emerging, that we'll, we'll announce them as we go along. So will that have the actual original, um, I'm assuming these are people, the, the Trooping of the Colour, for example, I'm presuming that one of the Dimblebys was, was talking yeah, about inevitably. it. Yeah, <laughs> inevitably. <laughs> Bless yeah, them. Of course. Uh, uh, so that we'll keep the commentary yep. on it. And all will be the same, the original. I mean, all the, I mean, one of the things that, one of the things that comes up, by the way, is, um, is that I'm now faced with uh, all this archive, which has got, it's the army, loads of swearing in it, and, and um, the question is... We can is, cope with that sort of thing these days, can't we? Well, we're a little bit more timorous uh, about that, because it's online and so on, but nonetheless, it'll all be there, it's untapped, but the, the critical thing is we don't want to touch it, in other words, we will show it as it was broadcast, because that's right, these are records of how things were shown 20, 30, 40 years ago, but the hope is that it will then spark interest in the archive, and people can go and find out more as, as they wish.
Right, and, and also I think you, you've got a new arts series, is that right? got a new arts series. We are obviously a um, <coughs> premier arts channel out there, um, although that's not all we do. Um, uh, we're going to look at Art Nouveau. Uh, uh, and I think one of the things that BBC4, one of the things I want, want to try and do on 4 is, I think the idea is that not only are we a channel which doesn't want to say be the final word on the subject matter, we'll be a word on the subject matter, so, which gives you a chance to have proposition and position. But I also think particular takes from particular people are quite important. So recently, James Fox, um, an art historian from Cambridge, did us a three-parter on, on um, British painting in the 20th century and completely reevaluated it. I thought it was a fantastic piece of work which rethought how we got the painting we have until, up until about the 70s and, and reassessed it and said that most of the stuff is really brilliant. So the same with something like uh, with Art Nouveau, where instead of just doing a straightforward linear history, we'll be looking at three different cities and saying, here's a another way of looking at this short-lived but, but brilliant for its 15, 20 year existence um, uh, art movement, which was essentially about sort of sex and nature, um, as I'm told, uh, uh, <laughs> um, or both together. Um, uh, don't get the wrong idea. Um, uh, or do. Uh, I was going to say, it's probably got exactly the yeah, right idea, I don't know, yes. Yeah. Um, so the so idea is that we will, we will um, sort of feature it and, and uh, uh, look at it in that particular way. Another thing we've got um, coming up, talking of, you were talking about The Killing 2, I think it's been announced actually, but I'll mention it, which is that there's a, there's a very well-known book out called The Slap, which is a story of a, the consequences of a, of, a, of a barbecue party in Australia when uh, a man slaps a young boy who's a particularly irritating child, and the reverberations of this slap uh, across eight people's lives is enormous, and it's a very telling piece of social drama, and um, it's the highest... I think the highest funded Australian drama ever, television drama, which we have acquired and will be playing out sometime later on this autumn. So that's another, that's a different facet of, that's no subtitles, although you, you, you may think you might need them. Sorry, I'm doing <laughs> It's me insulted the entire continent now. <laughs> oh dear. Oh no, my brother was. Well, they're very rude about the Brits, yes. so you know. Yes, and some of them And I'm German be. anyway, so I can, I'm, yeah. I'm liberated from that problem. You're allowed to. Yeah. Do you think Sky Arts has nicked some of your, um, of the jewels in your crown though, in terms of things like, for example, doing live operas, live plays, that sort of thing? No, would be my answer. I mean, they've, they've certainly, Nicked Mad Men um, at huge expense. Uh, and there you go. Good luck to them. I hope it works for them. I mean that. You know, they're, they're a commercial company. And they're very limited to, to spend their money as they wish. No, I think Sky Arts uh, and BBC Four are completely different things. Um, if I'm frank, I think BBC Four spends pretty much all of its money on programmes and very little on marketing. Uh, and I think Sky is probably the reverse. Um, but then I suppose, are, I, well, I would, but I would different job to do. Yeah, different job, and which also, is fine. and also, um, on many people's televisions, you can't get Sky Arts yet. Whereas actually, BBC Four uh, benefits from being very close to, you know, when you, when you're kind of shuffling through, as I randomly do, it, it comes up very fast. BBC Four, whereas yeah. Sky Arts, you know, even if you have it. Um, is often on like page six of your sky. Well, that might be one reason why their viewing figures are very low, but, but, <laughs> but <laughs> since you invite me to say that, um, look, I think Sky Arts does, a, you know, if you're looking for live theatre and so on television and so on, then I think it's a very good thing. I personally am not a huge fan of live theatre on television. Um, I don't think, it, I think if you want to watch live theatre, you might as well go. But that's yours as well, but you're assuming that people can actually get to wherever well, it is. Well, well, and sometimes it's quite difficult, particularly if you live in the wrong part of the country. That's true. I just think as an experience, it doesn't really work on television. I think it's not a particularly rewarding experience. Um, live, op and opera, actually funny enough, because it's so spectacle, often does work quite well. And we play quite a lot of opera. We have a, uh, you know, pieces from Glyndebourne or the Royal Opera House or, or English National Orchestra, uh, Opera House rather. Um, for, for me, Sky Arts is there to, to do what they do and we're there to do what I do. And I don't think we're actually competing with each other. Um, Certainly, there's plenty of noise with Sky Arts, and as I say, that's, that's absolutely their commercial choice. Now, you're quite keen on seasons, aren't you? How do you, how do you form a season, and what are you looking for when you're, when you're just sitting there in the bath, presumably? Uh, it's usually my bicycle when something oh, comes to me, actually. Oh, your bicycle, OK, yeah, right, yeah. OK. And so there you are on your bicycle, and you go, right, that's it. A season on mellow fruits. Okay. <laughs> um, well, first things first, I think we can lay, lay too much emphasis on seasons. They have a value in the digital world because it gives us noise and position, and it's very good then to have a, it means again you can have a position and perspective on a subject matter, different takes on it. So it's quite good, I think, in terms of generating some noise about, about areas of, uh, of interest. 
we only do six to eight a year, and I think they generate more noise than you would imagine from that. And I'm quite keen to say to people who often ask me, what's your next season, can I pitch into it? It's probably too late by then. By the time you've heard of it, it's too late. Frequently, the idea of seasons comes because I've already commissioned a two or three part, or even a single programme. I go, you know what, if we did a few more of those or something around it, and they're coming at the same time, let's do that. Or we've already got three or four programmes, and it feels like they could work quite nicely together um, uh, and I think, how, how might we position this lot? So I would rather, and a lot of the idea of seasons come from me, and I'm kind of running out, so uh, they're often my own personal interests, and that's why I did Iceland, because I happen to love Iceland. I did Germany, because I happen to be German. Uh, the Great Outdoors, because I like, yeah, as you can see. Um, right, so what else? I suppose I would the easiest like, thing is that there are independent sort of like? producers here. Just tell us what you like, <laughs> well, and then, I, we can, then they can Well, that would be you. one way of doing it, but I'm quite keen to encourage people to have ideas of their own to tell me what it might be. Um, but I it mean, helps if they know what you're, what you're looking for in the first place. So I'm looking, listen, I think any... One of the things I think we've done on four is demonstrate that almost pretty much... Well, people might challenge me on this, but any subject I can think of, you can make interesting if you choose to approach it. In a, in a way that's interesting. Have an idea about it. Jane Root used to say, a very good, interesting controller two years ago, don't give me a subject, give me an idea. And I agree with that. We're mainstream subject matter, but we approach things with a very BBC4 perspective, an idea, something which tells you about subject matter which you didn't know, but also that you could disagree with. Uh, Valdemar Janacek, uh, when he did Baroque, you might disagree with the way he approached that subject matter, but you'll certainly know more by the end of it. And once you've got that thought in your mind, that view of it, you can take that with you. It's quite empowering in some ways. And apply it to any of you see Baroque and determine for yourself or take another view. So I want ideas from people rather than say, here's, here's an area, can you, you know, give me your stuff? I, I would like to feel that we're open to people having their ideas towards me rather than me going, I want this, this and this. So are you kind of looking for, for things which are essentially, which are, I mean, you talk about uh, Valdemar there, but it, it, so presenter-led, as it were, people with passions, is that what it is? It often... Even if it's a passion that, that lots of people might disagree with. I think it does... Or a viewpoint. It does might. help to have a presenter. Uh, what you kind of want is somebody, a lot of times, we don't want everything presented, but what, what you want from presenters is a, a position, authorship, their view, but it has to be underpinned with credibility. So not everybody will do, and obviously you want that position to be an interesting one. Um, and in that sense, presenters are very valuable. I mean, as I say, James Fox, who's an art historian, um, we were talking about various things, and I said, I'm quite interested in British painting. He said, well, actually, I think they're amazing. And of course, if you think about British painting from the beginning of the 20th century to about 1975, it's been largely derided it's not that good. Paris and New York were the big thing. Abstract and a bit of cubism and, you know, Picasso and they were all rubbish. We're too pastoral. Actually now, on the, on the art markets, British paintings of that from sort of, you know, from Paul Nash through to Hockney, pretty big art now. Pretty big. But very Brit a very British way of looking at modernism. That comes from James's mind. That's really interesting. Now, other people, A.A. A. Gill, notably in the Sunday Times, disagreed. That's fair enough. But you've got a position. And I think that's, there's something very attractive and quite interesting uh, uh, about a presenter who has a bit of energy and a bit of life and says, here, listen to me. This is what I think. Look at it this way. That's what we would like. Doesn't apply to everything. And are you looking for, for, for people who, who we perhaps haven't heard of, or are you... Uh, Don't care. Famous or not famous. Um, if it's, you know, uh, uh, celebrity, Stephen Fry and Wagner. Actually, wouldn't mind knowing what Stephen Fry thinks about Wagner. That's about something which feels really interesting. I'm, you know, Stephen Fry and Wagner, it's a nice little mix. Um, actually, is it, Stephen Fry just knows so much about everything, everything I don't true. know. Just Joe Brand on crying. We made a fantastic Joe thing. Joe Brand yeah. can't cry, doesn't like crying, and yeah. doesn't know what his crying's about, which I agree with her. Actually, what is that gas going, when, you know, all that stuff. I love crying. You know, well, fair enough. Um, <laughs> that's your prerogative. <laughs> it don't do it now. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, cry. but I mean, I love a programme which makes me cry. Uh, yeah, uh, know, for okay, example, I tell you what, I saw Surviving Hitler. Um, oh, yes, that's a, uh, that, is story. that not amazing? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was amazing. that made me cry. Good. Yeah, well, I, well, I say good in a nice way, of course. But, but my um, point is that, that there is Joe Brand on crying feels like a really spicy mix. It's quite, you know that Joe Brand will be funny, but it's also quite insightful. It's all about why do we cry I and mean, all that kind of business. It was a fascinating programme. Yeah. I did. That I, so it's I that combination. I want her to cry. It's that combination. 
Yes, I, I agree with you, actually. Um, we, we maybe we should have asked on. her. Go she's she's going to do kissing next, I think, or maybe I shouldn't have said that. Laura, have I done something? <laughs> Who knows? Um, I've blown it, haven't I? Now, funny enough, um, the love story, the uh, surviving, uh, surviving Hitler... Yeah. Uh, followed by another great film. Did you watch that one? Uh, well, it was, was either <laughs> followed or was preceded by The Pendle Witch Child, which I also thoroughly enjoyed. That's an amazing film, though. It was yeah. so good, because I was actually wanting to see something else on another channel, and I only happened on that, because I thought, I'll watch this for 15 minutes until the other thing started, and never changed over um, and we just had an, another tweet uh, was the Pendle witch child pitched to you with the animation elements or did they emerge in an, as an idea later on in production came out of blue okay. uh, it, the, 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 the idea was one that Archie Barron had talked to me about ages and ages and I, I'd always thought it was a fantastic Archie story Barron, as in um, he runs a company called uh, how could right, I forget okay. his name but he, he's a company. very interesting and right. good uh, uh, I'll remember his, his company in a moment uh, but he delivers very well, good stuff for the channel. He made um, the joy of stats for us as well. Um, he, he came to me with the stories I've always liked, and then I decided we were going to do a children in history season, a little moment looking at, looking at history through the eyes of children, through different children coming into the, into the picture, and so I commissioned, I said, great chance to do that. And it, they just, it just arrived, done. I mean, it was a brilliant story, by the way. For those of you who don't know what it was, it was astonishing, all about. Actually. It was an astonishing story about the 17th century and about a, a child who essentially claimed that her entire family uh, and relatives and na neighbours were all witches. And eleven of them. She had them killed. Eleven of them, and they all went to to, to the scaffold. They were all hung hanged. or burned. Yeah. And then, um, about 20 years later, she herself. Uh, was uh, proclaimed as a witch, and because the situation had changed, and uh, James the First, I think it was, it was Charles Stuart the First, uh, second time, was yeah. Charles Stuart, who, he was very interested and said, you know, um, I'm sorry, but there are far too many witches in this sort of thing, and I just want to check. And it was just the most brilliant, brilliant programme, and it had this strange animation, which was like rather sort of haunting, almost floated and, and haunting. Yes, over the, the critical over thing about the programme, which is why it's BBC Four, is it basically turned on the fact that. When this girl first made her accusation, children's testimony was not acceptable in a British court. It wasn't seen as valid. James I changed that rule to allow her testimony to be taken as writ, as a result of which all her family were hung and killed on her testimony. 35 years later, when she's accused, and she, when she's, accused, uh, she's accused of being a witch, she persuades Charles Stuart to change the law back so that children's testimony is no longer acceptable, and she gets off. <laughs> it's a really... Quite macabre story, actually. It is. Like we so. need more of those with the animation. Uh, right, unless, unless you have anything else that you would like to uh, show, I'm going to ask if anybody else has any questions since um, I don't know if there are people without Twitter. Yes. Yes, you and yes. Well, act. Let's use that word. Just looking at Six Music and, BB and Radio 2, do you think that, I know you said that they are distinctive channels, BBC 2 and BBC 4, do you think potentially there might be some kind of model for annexing it under one, one, one person in the, in the same way, or, or are they just too distinct? No, yes and no. How about that? Uh, no, I don't Precise. think BBC 4, Well, <laughs> BBC 4 will not be axed, as far as I'm aware. Um, obviously, it's still under review and so on, and it's not, everything's not definitive, but as far as I can tell, there's... No major plans to do that, and I suppose I'd know by now. Um, will BBC Four face uh, some consequence of a, of a BBC-wide reduction in our funding of 20%? Well, I imagine so. It's inevitable that there will be some reduction in, in funding. BBC Four will take its share, I'm sure, like every other BBC service. Um, no, yes, no. Third bit uh, was, will we become a, an annex of BBC Two? Well, I don't think so. As I say, I think Two and Four are very distinctive, and I think they do different jobs. Let's be clear, at the moment, uh, at least until uh, the entire world goes completely digital, we function on a digital platform, which, uh, as it were, exclusively. Uh, and I think within the digital, digital world, BBC4 is a very, very distinctive offer. Pretty much everything on, in the digital world offered out there is, um, is stripped and stranded or has a very particular uh, way of operating. BBC4 is completely different. We, don't, we have seasons. Uh, we have a fast turnover of subject matter, we're changing all the time. And also, in terms of our, our, our actual intellectual position, uh, that idea of being a channel for arts, music, knowledge, culture, ideas, uh, a, a place that entertains through discourse where intelligence 
um, with a slice of vulgarity, with thanks to Peter. Um, uh, I think uh, that sort of thing is, is, I think, is it unique? Well, close to out there. And so I don't think there's any call at the moment to see that BBC Two and BBC Four fit that well. There's, there's a bit of overlap. There always is. And there should be, by the way, between channels. There's, we're a portfolio. There should be a relationship between one, two, three, and four. We don't live in isolation. Um, it's important that things that play on two get repeated on four, and it's important that one, two things that play on four repeat on two. If, if for no other reason than more people see it, good use of license fee pairs money. Um, but I don't think, as I said, I don't think audiences have a problem with the fact that there are two channels that, 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 that are largely factual but have a good different remit. Right, any other questions? Do you want some water, by the way? Oh, uh, yeah, go on then. I'll have some water. Thank you. Uh, right, meanwhile, I'll, I'll, well, well, and while you have a break, it's a drinking of water, I've just had a tweet saying, you really enjoyed me explaining Pendle Witch Child. Can I summarise the killing in two minutes? I, that would be absolutely no problem whatsoever. Sophie Grubble wears the same jumper and solves the killing. But meanwhile, lots of plot turns along the way, and it turns out that the person at the end who actually did the killing was the person I thought it did the killing, uh, whilst having lots of twists and turns and red herrings. Is that sorted? That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, excellent jumper behaviour as well. <laughs> yes, and it's and then that, that gentleman at the back. Do you feel that uh, there's any more you could do for thinking young people, um, where where you're re reaching out to sort of 13, 14, 15, who don't want to go and watch uh, BBC Three, they don't want wacky stuff that's a bit yeah. crazy. They'd actually like to develop their brain while they're preparing for their GCSEs and their A levels. Do you know? Well, in, in this audience group, I don't know about 13, 14, but to 16 to 34, which is the younger group television-wise, um, BBC4, typically, if you think we are 70% um, um, uh, older skewing, we're about 30% younger skewing. So we're large... We're, we're so it's 11%, than, 16 to 34, I've got. Oh, I saw a figure that said 33%. Uh, I wonder where I got that from. I got it from broadcast, I think. Anyway... We're not a channel which, we're certainly an older uh, skewing channel, there's no question about that. No, ch 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 I, well, um, perhaps some 16 to 34s 30 might enjoy the panel, which I think some of our science programming uh, appeals to, tends to have a younger appeal, and I would say things like Charlie Brooker, who um, is now largely working on BBC Two, but will be doing one or two more pieces for BBC Four. Um, I think it's quite difficult, if I'm honest with you. Um, Okay, I don't think my channel is aimed at an age demographic. I never have done. I've always thought that our, this channel, unlike BBC Three, uh, my channel is aimed at an attitudinal demographic. If you are into this kind of thing, if your mind thinks like this, then you're going to like us. And I don't think that's to do with age. I think people have it or they don't. Which is why, ultimately, I also feel that BBC Four's audience is capped. I mean, we're never going to be a multi-million audience channel. That's not the sort of thing we are. We're always going to have a relatively smaller audience. We're also going to be somewhere where I think people come and go. They come into it and pick what they want and leave again. They're not going to watch it from what it sounds like you're doing, which is great, actually. Well, I do, but I tell you what the worst thing is. Of course, you only start at 7, so when I... Yeah, you know, well, if, you, if you're starts. a shift worker, you've got problems, haven't you, watching during the yeah, day? Yeah, cold starts hard. I mean, that, that, we, you know, we, we, we broadcast from 7 to about 2 or 3 in the morning, which means our shit, you know, we get, we get 1.3 during broadcast hours. And Maybe you could just repeat it all, the whole thing. We don't have the space. 7 till... What, what do you mean, Jack? Yeah, well, uh, 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 CBBC is playing on. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, aspect. of course. So people are I don't think my job is to aim at a particular age group. It is to aim, if you like this stuff, and so I'm hoping that there are some 13, 14, 16, 18, 25-year-olds who will come to us because they like what we do, rather than because they're going, here, this is what you might like. Does that, does that make sense? There's a gen gentleman I, I, up there. I'm, I'm just not in the game of offering for an age group. Well, I'm delighted if I had some more marketing money. I'd be, I'd be up for that. Yes. It's the marketing. Uh, there's a gentleman up. up there with, uh, uh, with a hand up. Who's, with his hand up, yes. Microphone being passed to you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Richard, my name is Lee Thompson. I'm the head of music for BT Vision, the uh, video on demand service. So I'm inevitably going to ask you a question about music. Um, Top of the Pops, obviously 1976 archives, being shown weekly at the moment. Um, three parts. Are you surprised at how well it's actually performed for you? No. Uh, second part, uh, <laughs> what are your intentions with the rest of the Top of the Pops archive? Yes. And uh, the other question is, um, what made you actually decide on 1976 as the, as the starting point for this whole sort of journey, as it were? It was well, a lovely hot summer. Yes, it was. Uh, we all remember that. Oh, some, no. Uh, well, people told me about it. 
Yes, me too. <laughs> yeah, I heard about it. it I'll ask that third bit last, which is um, the reason why we're doing it. Is it. I'd love to give you a very really smart answer, but it turns out that the archive, the Top of the Pops archives, actually begins complete from spring 76. <laughs> It just struck me as being a witty thing to do, that on the very night that it played out in 76, uh, we would then play it out again on BBC Four 35 years later. And, but it also happens that 30, 76 is a change year. We're about to go into uh, a, a much more um, broader range of pop music coming out, punk and, and disco and so on happening. So it felt like quite a cool thing to do 35 years on. Uh, and it's uh, quite cheap, I'm assuming. Uh, it, it's virtually free, so uh, it's very handy. We have played out all the other ones, and there are, there are sort of collectors out there who then point to ones that we haven't got. And I don't know, there's a real group out there who understand when we don't quite put the right one at the same time. But uh, our plans for going forward are um, not wholly finished yet, but there, there will, we will, I will definitely be doing a couple more little things to make it a bit more fun again going forward. I've got one particular idea for later on next year, which, I'll, which I think people will enjoy, where we do a bit of a moment again. Um, and we're planning to kind of play around with other things where we might be able to kind of run things like that again, again for people's interests, this time from the past. Can I suggest that Christmas Day? Yes. You play literally kind of seven or eight Christmas Day episodes. Okay. I, I They'd have Wizard on every single one. <laughs> we'd, yeah, we're booked. We're, no, it, it's, it's, I think Christmas, one of the things we do on Christmas, Christmas Day is we, we play, we, we try and reflect something of the, the, the solemnity of the season. Um, but I'm sure we could fit something in. That might be more like it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this lady here. Phil, are you taking notes? Guten Tag, Herr Klein. Guten Tag. Wie geht's? Wir können ruhig Deutsch sprechen. Nein, sehr schlecht. Um, I, I'm uh, Julie Craig from North Sea Screen Partners. My reason for breaking into German there is that we have a partner in Germany. I wondered on your perspective on collaboration and further transnational sort of projects, given the appetite around the North Sea countries in general for uh, uh, subtitling, which is obviously a more feasible way of uh, presenting programmes for multinational uh, viewing. Well, um, I can confess a guilty secret here, which is, by and large, although we are keen and enthusiastic um, acquirers of a lot of this programming, we're not really in the market financially, funding-wise, to be senior co-production partners. Um, there's, a, there's a big funding gap between those two positions, as you will know. Uh, I'm hugely in support of a lot of the programme that's coming out of, as you said, the North, the Scandinavian countries and Germany and so on, because in many ways what, they, what they're making, the actual programme, reflects quite a lot of a British sensibility about television as well, which isn't true necessarily of other uh, uh, countries. But all, in America too, I think quite a lot of American programming is, has a different feel and vibe. Um, one thing I notice with a lot of American, which is why not, not much of it appears on BBC4, is how incredibly beautiful everybody looks, unlike most of real life, obviously present company accepted. Um, and I find that quite difficult then to, to buy into a lot of the time with American television. And I think BBC Four audiences might do as well, since they seem to quite like the rather more realistic interpretation of life that you get from drama programming. And from Joe Brand, for example. And crying. Well, well, not yeah, crying. Not crying, in Joe's <laughs> case. Um, but I'm not really in a... In, I mean, as I said, we are, and, and interestingly, um, what is true is that as, as a result of BBC Four acquiring the killing, uh, which, by the way, was it went out in Denmark in 2008, and we purchased it um, late last year, and after it had sort of finished, and they, it wasn't selling anywhere else, it's completely revived it. Oh, it's right, now sold we, I think in, there was an assumption that, that you'd bought it in 2008 and no, sat no, no, on no, it no, for no, years, no, no, and, I, no, and you I, just put it out. We saw it in, in, on an afternoon screening, we, you know, with the usual popcorn and, and, and Fanta, and... Um, <laughs> bought it and said, well, we should get this. And it kind of, I mean, I argue about it as well, actually, in some ways. Um, but it, as a result, it's, it's now sold to another 30 or 40 new territories as a result of revived interest from, from the BBC and, yeah. and, and actually winning a battle. And, of course, RTS being so remade with a very, very skinny lead character in America. It, it's spooky, I think. I watched the trail for The Killing for the American one, and it was literally frame for frame identical, except in American, from the from the... The Danish version, I th it was quite curious. I mean, it was watchable. It was, it's obviously very good, but it was quite weird. And I presume everybody is just gorgeous and nobody looks normal. Funny enough, in this one, it's slightly less, it's slightly less of that, no. actually. I couldn't bear to watch it. No. Just because of the first one being so marvellous. Right, I think notice there was a question of that gentleman there. The, yeah, sorry, the, with the, the, the here, yeah. Uh, 
Hello, hi, Daniel Tool. Uh, I had a general question for you, which is, in your perspective, what is the future of factual, given that the statistics show for people who choose what to watch online, they're watching more than is available on traditional TV? Are you asking me about the future of, uh, of, of programmes on television or the future of factual programmes per se? I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've always worked on the assumption that people are, are, are ever curious. Hmm. And I mean, I think the one thing that you can say about television is it's a fantastic creator of content, which isn't actually true about a lot of online. Um, uh, I mean, most of the big online organisers don't produce a huge amount of content, as far as I can tell, and have found it very hard, in fact, much harder than they think they thought it would, they would, to find the kind of content that was going to break through. And the reason television has managed to do that, so it continues to do it so well, and the reason why I think channels continue to kind of be more uh, important than people thought they were going to be is because, A, they have an editorial mind, they're a position, they are someone... It's because I think there is, a, there is an assumption that the programmes just come, you just pick them off a shelf. Actually, someone's got to decide which ones to have and the reason for that, and then to make them and to fund them, and I think that's, been in the, that's one of the reasons why television has remained as strong as it has. Factual is particularly strong because it's cheap, and it delivers a lot of big hours compared to, say, drama or entertainment. I mean, big entertainment drama shows are a million quid an hour. Except that presumably um, you can sell those on. I mean, that's the difference. You can with sell a big factual drama show against show. too if you get the right. Yeah, appeal. you get more, but presumably you you, you sell more. And Much then. bigger risk. I mean, um, you know, uh, Mad Men cost 2.4 million US dollars to make per episode. I bet they've recouped that over and over and over. Well, I don't know. Anyway, neither does it. Okay. My, my, point, my point is that, that, yeah. that, that factual will remain important and content yeah. will remain king, in my view. Yeah. Hello, Richard. Hello, Christian. Uh, How are you? Hello. I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> um, Good. Uh, you've talked a lot about, um, about presenter led programmes um, right. and showed quite a few clips of them. Um, obviously, a lot of um, smaller companies and documentary filmmakers who work through those smaller companies look to BBC Four as the home of the one off documentary. Now, with, with the budget inevitably reducing a bit, do you think it's those sorts of films that are going to get squeezed and thereby that sector? Well, I hope not. Um, I think BBC4 actually has, has maintained a tradition of doing quite a lot of observational documentary programming uh, and single programmes as well. I, I would say one thing, just to, uh, to go back to presenters. If you are a small independent and you find it quite hard to break through, which is not uncommon, I know that, there is no surer way than having a very, very good bit of on-screen talent because that gives you something exclusive. So if you find somebody who you think is really, really good, who works really well on screen and has got something to say, that's a good bit of way of breaking down the door, in my opinion. Observation so document. rugby tackle Stephen Fry outside the graduate Well, class. no, I think you want something new. You, 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 no. Is, well, are you welcome to if you... <laughs> but not, not for that reason. <laughs> um, in terms of observational documentary, yes, I think if you have access to um, somewhere or something or someone uh, who you want to film over a, over a period, then that is quite a good way of breaking through as well. BBC Four has got a good, I think, and fine track record of doing, I mean, Agony and Ecstasy came to me actually via quite a big company, but the filmmaker wasn't particularly well known, and I think it had been turned down by one or two other larger organisations, um, and I commissioned it on the spot, and she said we should do that from, from the taster. A good taster tape... There will always be room, I promise, for those sorts of things, as long as it's the right subject matter and, and the right appeal. The, uh, I've had another tweet, although I think possibly this might have been already addressed, uh, and we might have been, have been addressed, touched on by you, talking about army and all that sort of stuff. Uh, all the documentaries you've talked about are arts or science is for still going to do other forms of documentary, and I know you mentioned about army soldiers. Um, not, not army, the, yeah. yes, yeah, the army. Um, speedy, yes. example, social and international. Well, Storyville um, uh, remains an integral part of BBC Four's offer. That's 25, 27 films a year. And going forward, I see no reason why Storyville will not be doing international films. Um, big ones at that, um, that win Emmys and Oscars and so forth. We also will carry on doing international programming of various sorts. We still do. Um, uh, we've just finished a long-running series, and we're looking to see about how we might replace it. Um, the last version of it was called Syrian School, where we filmed in a different school in various countries uh, for, uh, across a year, which Lion Television made brilliantly with, together with the Open University. Open University cut its funding in various ways, and so we were forced to rethink how we would fund that. So, Peter, that was the one for you. But, um, for, for youngsters who... Um, yeah, for 
clever youngsters. Um, although most of the university seems to be full of quite older youngsters, doesn't it? Yes, it, it um, does. Older youngsters going back and going having back. a kind of a, yeah, exactly, having, after having their a, extended Having a really gap, good yeah. summer. <laughs> um, uh, so we will do international programming. Um, I think we're trying to reflect the international world, partly through arts, partly through science, partly through history. Um, so no, we will carry on doing a, a range of, of, um, of genre. Okay, genre. Peter, final, st final question. Oh. Peter York. What does business offer you in terms of programming ideas? Because it's a very important part of people's lives. And most other channels treat it either in the mandatory statutory way, they report the Dow Jones, or they do formulaic things because it's deemed too difficult. So you get The Apprentice, which is panto business. <laughs> Where does business belong for you? I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, I'm not sure that we've actually done it very well. Overall. Have you done it at all? I could, well, maybe it's something that I just looked at. If it has the word business in, I'll probably switch over. Um, I'm not sure we have. I'm not sure we're funded for it particularly. There's not a reason to ignore it. Um, it wouldn't be, I, you know, my central remit is music, arts, culture, knowledge, and so forth. And so business has probably formed the wayside. And it's felt that, you know, actually Dragon's Den is the other on BBC Two, for example, which sees itself as a big... A, a seller of business, which does give you an indication of the toughness of business, although, again, um, uh, it's got a certain sense of humour about it as well. Business is culture. Yes, but, and, yes, and actually, well, and I'm just thinking as well, I mean, what a great series. I can just see a season strand coming on about kind of like stock exchanges and things. I mean, I'd, I'd be quite interested I, in I would, I, I've got a, a, a big series later on next year, which is exploring the consequence of um, the recession and cuts. Uh, which will give some indication of business through an observational direction. But it's not overtly business. And um, no, well, perhaps I shall start thinking more about it. Thank you very much. And that's all we have time for. Thank you very much uh, for coming in. And thank you to Richard Klein uh, for being so entertaining and informative. Thank you. Thank you.